This morning's reading is taken from a book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5, starting at verse 21. You have heard it said that it was told to those of old, you shall not, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to be to the council, and whoever you and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first to be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than, than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off, right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body goes into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, CCP family. Can you all hear me okay? It's the first time I'm using this. Um, yeah, I'm, if you don't know, I'm, my name is Stuart. I'm the new kid on the block, and um, we're working our way through a series in the Sermon on the Mount, um, one of the most uh, practical, hard-hitting and uh, down-to-earth sermons that's ever been preached, um, and today's passage is no exception to that. So I'm just going to ask you to bow with me as we ask the Lord for his help. Father, we are let down often by our own thoughts. We are deceived easily. We are ignorant um, of greater realities, and so we need your word to break through all of that and to speak to us. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that the power of your word would change us from the inside out, for that is what we need, and that we would not shy away from seeing what you want us to see there uh, and knowing that Christ has forgiven us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, in our, our passage today, Jesus unpacks the sixth and seventh commandments, um, murder and adultery. They've been memorably referred to as the taking of someone's life or of their wife, uh, for that is what those things are, a kind of theft, uh, really the two most destructive kinds of theft that could probably ever happen in this life. And they're both uh, massive problems uh, around the world, and not least in our own country. Just in the last uh, three months of 2021, a total of 6,859 South Africans were murdered. That works out at about 76 people per day, which is on par with some countries that are undergoing a civil war. It's astonishing. As Psalm 139 tells us, we've been knit together in the womb. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. And so murder is, is an assault on the sanctity of human life. It's also an assault on God himself because he's made us in his very image. 
adultery statistics in South Africa make for equally disturbing uh, reading. Ashley Madison is a website that markets itself as a dating and hookup service that particularly targets married people. Basically, it's a service that makes it easier and more convenient for you to commit adultery. And of the 50 countries open to the service, South Africa ranks 12th in popularity. It has a staggering 3,300 signups per month. There are a few things that are more painful than betrayal in a marriage. And so if murder undoes the life-giving work of God in the womb, then adultery undoes the life-joining work of God between two people. But the question we must ask ourselves is, are those simply problems out there, or are they also problems in here? See, our natural tendency is to draw a line down the middle with the murderers and the adulterers on one side, and while the rest of us on the other side. They are the law breakers, we are the law keepers. They are the baddies, we are the goodies. And when we think like that, we show that actually we are no better than the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Uh, they were introduced to us last Sunday in verses 17 to 20. Uh, good enough showed us that the Pharisees had turned the law into a list of do's and don'ts. It was never intended to be that. They thought that they were righteous because their external behavior conformed to God's commands. And so as far as they were concerned, the law had everything to do with their actions and nothing to do with their inner thoughts and desires of their hearts. And so this is what Jesus meant in verse 19. He's speaking to them when he says that they are relaxing the commandments that God has given. It's why he says in verse 20 that for those who would be part of his kingdom, they would need to have a righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. See, we've not begun to follow Jesus until we're as concerned with our attitudes in here as we are with our actions. If the Pharisees and the religious experts kept this misunderstanding to themselves, well, that would be one thing. But remember, these are Israel's teachers. And so they are misinterpreting and they're misapplying God's law for all of Israel to hear. And so for the rest of this chapter, Jesus is going to give six examples of laws that have been misinterpreted by the Pharisees. He's going to address that. And he introduces each one with the phrase, you have heard that it was said. If you're taking notes, that comes in verse 21, 27, 31, 33, 38, and 43. And in each case, he contrasts that with his explanation of what the law really means. He says, but I say to you, and that comes up verse 22, 28, 32, 34, 39 and 44. And so we're going to uh, tackle the first two of those in our passage today. Uh, there's two simple points. The prohibition against murder includes anger, and the prohibition against adultery includes lust. So our, our first point then is the prohibition against murder includes anger. Look at verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. See, everyone would agree that murder is evil, that it makes you liable to God's judgment, but 
Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes one step further. He says, you need to know that anger towards another person makes you liable to judgment. Because God sees more than just our actions. He sees the motives and the intentions of our hearts as well. See, Jesus understands that murder doesn't just come out of nowhere. No one on this planet wakes up one morning randomly and says to themselves, you know what, today I think I feel like going and killing someone. That's not how it works. Murder always starts in the heart. Imagine like this. Our hearts are like a soil. And one day something happens to us. Someone says something or they do, they do something. It might even be something trivial or small. And a tiny seed of anger is planted in our hearts that day. And we can't let it go. We, we water it as we come back to it again and again. We think about it and we, we even plan about what we should do about it. You do that long enough and eventually it becomes a full-grown tree with the fruit of murder that is hanging on its branches. And so if you like, the Pharisees are saying, there's no fruit of murder hanging on my tree, and so it's all good. God and I are good. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 it, it doesn't work like that. See, the only difference between you and the murderer is the size of your tree. Yours just hasn't produced fruit yet. But if you allow your anger to grow, you will be shocked at what you are capable of. One uh, Christian author uh, puts the point across this way. He says that many people in the deepest feelings of their hearts have anger and hatred to such a degree that their true desire is for the hated person to be dead. The fact that fear, cowardice, or lack of opportunity does not permit them to take that person's life does not diminish their guilt before God. You see what he's saying? It's, it's quite a frightening thought, isn't it? That the only difference between us and a murderer is that they're braver than we are. See, one of the, the many things that we learned about our country in lockdown was the link between alcohol and violence. To the extent that we had to ban alcohol in order to keep the, the trauma units empty. Remember that? But it's not that too much alcohol causes violence. It's that too much alcohol makes one brave. It lowers your inhibition so that the anger and the hatred that are already there in your heart can be more easily expressed in violent actions. Alcohol can be like the key that unlocks the door of your heart to show everyone what's truly there. And you see, surely Jesus is right to say that we can't pat ourselves on the back because we haven't murdered when there is anger and there is hatred in our hearts. But before we move on, I just want to, to pause and to think about an important question first. I think it's going to help us to, to really get to the root of what Jesus is saying here. And that it's this, what causes us to get angry? What causes us to get angry? I'm not talking about superficially, you didn't get your coffee that day and so you're grumpy. Nothing like that. I'm saying at its core, at its root, what, what is it? But well, we need to find the answer in the Bible, and um, there's a book on anger by Christopher Ashe and Steve Midgley, which uh, has, has been really helpful for me here. It surveys every expression of anger in Scripture, and they came to this conclusion. They said that the triggers that set off anger vary, you know, not getting your coffee, but the rage that is triggered always reveals in some way what the angry person truly values and treasures. Anger rises in my heart when something I value is either threatened or taken from me. And they go on to say that there are four kinds of treasures whose loss or threatened loss 
especially triggers anger in us. The first is that we treasure control. That when something gets in the way of our desire to control something, whether that's a team that we lead at work, uh, whether that's someone who cuts in front of us in the traffic, whether it's what we want for our children, we get really, really angry because we've lost control. Second thing he says, we treasure our possessions, wanting to own something or, or not wanting to lose something because we can't imagine our life without it. For example, our car or an investment, a family heirloom, we get angry. Third, he says, we treasure intimate relationships. Sex and romance are, are wonderful when things are going well, but they can be really ugly when things are going wrong. This is not a pleasant statistic if you're married, but I'm going to say it anyway. There is a connection between anger and intimacy in that the person that you are most likely to be killed by is your spouse. That's a sobering thought as you go to bed tonight. The last thing is that we treasure our reputation. When our name has been tarnished and our ego is wounded, all we want to do is scream and shout, how could they do that to me? See, we care too much about what people think and say about us, and so we get angry. And so the next time you get angry, here's an exercise. Ask yourself, what is it that I value in this moment that I feel is being threatened? And when you can identify what that is, to ask a follow-up question, which is, am I right to treasure this as much as I do? More often than not, we'll find that, that perhaps we are not right. That in that moment, what we really need is to treasure Christ more than those things. And so our anger is often sinful. And that, by the way, is the great difference between our anger and Jesus' anger. You know, many people like to think that they've, they've trapped Jesus out here in these words. They say, you know, how, how can he condemn anger here when we know in other parts of the Gospels, Jesus gets angry? So he's a hypocrite. Well, just a moment's thought would, would lead us to see that Jesus' anger was what we would call righteous anger. In his anger, he never sinned. Because his anger was never, ever caused by a love for control, a love for possessions, relational intimacy, or reputation. His anger was always the anger for sin and injustice that is committed towards uh, other people. His was anger when he saw the glory of God's holy name being trampled on. Is it not the case that for Jesus, he was the calmest at a time when he endured the most sin and injustice against himself? Just think of the peace that he showed when he was betrayed, beaten, mocked, and crucified for something that he didn't do. He stayed silent when he had a chance to defend his reputation before the Sanhedrin. He rebuked Peter when he sliced off the guard's ear in Gethsemane. He told him to put his sword down because he refused to take control of the situation by force. Instead, he entrusted it into his father's hands. Jesus' anger was always righteous. The truth is that we are so centered on ourselves that most of the time our anger is an attempt to get our own way. But Jesus shows us how there is actually a better way to live. And when we value him more than anything else, that is when anger starts to lose its grip on our lives. So we've seen that followers of Jesus will be as concerned by the anger in our hearts as we will be with the violence of our actions. And if this is our concern, then Jesus goes on to say, 
that you can't just have a right understanding of this commandment. You also have to have right practice. So verse 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the God and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you paid the last penny. Jesus gives us two case studies here. It gets really practical. What should we do when our anger has caused a breakdown in relationship? Because that is always what anger does. You will find that the angriest people over time always become the loneliest people because they've hurt everyone who tries to get near them. Anger has left marriages and tatters, friendships ruined, communities and even countries at war. How sad is it that so many families have been ruled by anger in the home by a parent so that everyone else walks around on eggshells, terrified that they might do something wrong. See, the point that Jesus is getting at in both of these case studies is that the stakes are so high relationally with people that you need to go and make right immediately. In verse 24, it's even more important than your worship. That's quite something. God wants you to come to peace with another person more than he wants your sacrifice in those times, in our times, more than he wants you here today, more than he wants your gifts or your money. Because he's never fooled by our attempts to hide behind church, to avoid the relationships that we've caused pain in. That's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy to pretend that everything is all right with you and God when not everything is all right with you and someone else. And then the same thing in verse 25. Before you get to court, make sure that you settle the issue. Jesus isn't saying that, that going to court is necessarily sinful. That's not his point here. His point is simply that you need to resolve the conflict quickly. It's only going to get more complicated the longer you take to reconcile. You know, when the wounds have not been properly acknowledged, healing can't take place. And the more time that goes by, we know that the more bitterness and the more hatred festers so that it becomes harder and harder to do that. He's saying, don't wait. Do it now. And obviously, this is all with the, the proviso, which we must say that even if you are to make attempts to reconcile, the other person still may reject those attempts. And what all you have to say is that that is not really up to you. That in those circumstances, you can say that as much as it depended on you, you did everything that you possibly could. And then you leave it at that and you trust God. So let me ask you, I think the key uh, application question here is, are your actions the source of pain or bitterness or feelings of revenge in someone that you haven't made right with? Heed Jesus' words, go and make right with them as a matter of extreme urgency. Well, Jesus now moves on to consider another dangerous force in the human heart. It's that of lust. And so that's our second point, is the prohibition against adultery includes lust. Look at verse 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just like murder, Jesus uh, takes this commandment against adultery 
much further than the physical act. He's saying you can't congratulate yourself for avoiding illicit sexual activity with someone when you're committing it in your mind. God sees the lustful intentions of the heart. One um, Christian author just captures it so well. It's this, 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 these verses. He says, to Jesus, even if we aren't literally touching, still we are really taking. We really are taking. That's what lust is. It's to take the image of someone that God has not given you in marriage and to use it for your own sexual gratification. Whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're married or unmarried, whether you're glancing at someone who's walking past or you're binging hours of pornography on the internet, whether the person is even aware that you've done it to them or not, it makes no difference. Lust is lust, and it's always wrong, Jesus says. And then in verse uh, 29 and 30, Jesus gives us an illustration of how we are to deal with lust. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Jesus here gives us the what and the why. First, what must we do with lust? Jesus says we must take it so seriously that we kill it. And let's just be clear here, when he talks about cutting off your, your, your hand and plucking out your eye, he isn't speaking literally at that point. Um, the early church father, Origen, uh, unfortunately did take this verse literally and he castrated himself. Uh, to his credit, he realized later on that he had misinterpreted it, which I think is a very brave thing to do. I don't know that I would admit that. But he, he eventually worked out that the problem doesn't lie with our eyes or with our hands. We know we can chop them off, but we're always going to find another way to lust because the problem is in our hearts. So yeah, Jesus is speaking metaphorically. And his point is that every true follower of Christ will have a deadly, serious attitude to lust. It's not going to be a sin that you take lightly. Uh, it's not going to be something that you mess around with or flirt with. It's going to be something that you will do whatever you can to avoid it. You will hate it because you love the Lord Jesus, and if you're married, because you love your spouse too. Now, practically speaking, this can mean many different things for each of us. What does it look like to, to cut off the hand, to, to pluck out the eye? Well, for some, it's to, to make yourself accountable to another Christian, where you can share your struggles and you can meet with them regularly, knowing that they're going to ask you hard questions. That's a great thing to do. For others, it'll be steering clear of, of certain types of books or TV series. You know, it's, it's interesting that someone's observed that in the, in the 90s, the, the TV series Friends, a uh, very popular TV series, was the first to show people watching pornography. They didn't show pornography, but just showed the characters watching pornography. It's only 25 years later where we actually have what in the 90s was classified as hardcore pornography on many, many of our TV shows today. And I think that for many, we are just so desensitized to that, uh, and it's like nothing to us. Uh, for others, it, it might mean stopping late-night conversations over social media or in chat rooms. I have a, a friend who used to house it for people um, to earn money, and whenever he did that, the first thing he would do when he got into the house was to unplug the DSTV, unplug the internet, hand it to them, and tell them to 
to lock it away somewhere safe. Now, is that, is that a, a bit embarrassing? Sure. Is it, is it inconvenient to do these things? Absolutely. We, we love some of these TV shows. Well, some people think that we're being too extreme in our world that says we must take advantage of every sexual fantasy that we have. Absolutely. But according to Jesus, being radical with lust is actually normal for any true Christian that's seeking to live for him. So he tells us what we must do, and then he tells us why. Because anything less will lead to hell. He says it's better to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. See, if we aren't prepared to say no to lust in the short term, then we are saying yes to hell in the long term. Um, in 2003, Aaron Ralston went m mountain climbing uh, when the unthinkable happened. A boulder that he was, he was climbing on shifted and it crushed his arm, leaving him trapped alone for 127 hours. You may have watched the movie that came out a few years ago by that title. And it, it shows how Aaron was faced with this difficult choice of dehydrating to death or cutting off his own arm in an effort to survive. And eventually Aaron chose the latter and he sawed through his arm just below the elbow with nothing but a pocket knife. He then had to twist his arm to break the bones so that he could get free, and eventually he was discovered by a helicopter and made a full recovery. Jesus says that we need to have Aaron's mindset when it comes to lust, that we must be willing to live as if we had no hands to touch, as if we had no eyes to see what wasn't ours, in order to be spared our whole body from the fire of hell. And so we must not forget these two things, that unrepentant lust will lead you to hell, and so we need to take radical measures to kill it. Uh, I just want to close uh, with a final word to any non-Christians that may be here, and then to, to Christians. Uh, to the non-Christian, can I say, after everything that I've said, the first step for you is to come to Jesus and to get a new heart. Uh, that there is really the problem here. And no amount of willpower, no amount of behavior modification is going to be enough. You need a new heart, and the good news is that Jesus wants to give it to you. He said in, in one of his Beatitudes earlier in the, in the sermon, the kingdom belongs to the pure of heart. See, it's only Jesus who can give us a pure heart. Perhaps you have committed murder or adultery. Perhaps you know that your anger or lust has destroyed the closest relationships you've had. Maybe you feel as if the guilt and the shame of what you've done can never be removed. I want to say Jesus can give you a pure heart if you ask him. He can do that in his grace through your faith in his death. He can take that guilt off your shoulders because he's paid for it on the cross. And you can live differently. We'd love to help you if you'd like to come and chat to good enough myself, maybe the person who brought you to the Christian, can I say, I know that, that these are really hard-hitting words. And who of us can say that we don't struggle in some way with anger and with lust? We give in to them because we've lost sight of who we have. Jesus is our treasure. And so with him, I don't need to use anger 
to hold on to other treasures that I feel are being threatened. He's the peace that our angry hearts need. And with him, I don't need to take with my eyes what doesn't belong to me because he is the lover that my lustful heart needs. And so when Jesus is what our hearts value most, then as Christians, we can pursue peace in our relationships and we can kill lust in our hearts at all costs. Will you bow with me as we pray? Father, with you, we truly have no place to hide. You know the secrets, the dark thoughts we have towards others for pleasure or revenge. Lord, will you forgive us for this? Help us to know that by your grace, our hearts have been made pure. Cleanse us by your Holy Spirit in those secret places. And Father, maybe you've placed on us a name of someone that you know we're not right with. Would you help us to go and reconcile with them quickly? And like Job, may we make a covenant with our eyes not to look lustfully on another person, but be captured by the beauty and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.